This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 197 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Thin Line Performance Products and Audible.com. This is Reese Koffler Stanfield from Georgetown, Kentucky. And this is Philip Parks from Fergus, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show. Also with our producer, Glenn, with us here today. Hey, guys, we have an exciting announcement to make, but we're going to wake everybody wait till the end of the show. All the way to the end? I know, we do. Yeah, we'll wait, we'll wait. Why not? <laughs> oh, okay, the anticipation is, is good for everyone, I guess, right? Yeah, <laughs> keeps you on your toes, what can I say? Good. Well, how are you guys this week? We're doing well. Reese, you're from Georgetown again, eh? I'm back. We um we drove home yesterday and um we actually did it did the drive in two parts. We went up to northern Florida to see um my international horse Casper and the Herndon family. So we stopped there for the evening, which was great. And um it broke up the trip. It's about I think it's 17 hours if you don't break it up. So it was nice to break it up, spend the night. And then we did our big trip yesterday. So I'm not going to lie. It's uh, the afternoon and I probably am going to get a coffee after the show. <laughs> and it's kind of cold idea. and rainy here. Yeah, kind of mm-hmm. cold and rainy. Um, but it was already so nice to get on the horses that I have home, here at home. And a couple of them, um, I'm not sure if they missed me, but they look like they missed me. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> a couple of them need, need some uh, muscle back. But um that's all good. And, and it was fun. And so far everybody had a, a safe trip home. So, uh, it was a great season in Florida and I hope everyone heard our excitement and all the fun stuff that we were doing down there. And, and I came back nice and refreshed. So, uh, that a very, very good trip for me. Now, the most important question is, was your husband happy to see you? Oh yeah, of course. Okay. I think he's really excited that I'm, I'm here to clean the house and go to the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. Is it uh, like how, how much weight has he lost? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think he's been eating out enough that it's... Sort of oh, lovely. maybe it's fast food. Maybe he's gained weight than yeah, Tom no. McDonald's and Wendy's or whatever, right? <laughs> exactly. I think, um, yeah, as as all the, the ladies would, would laugh at that, is, is he did have to go to the grocery store a few times by himself. But um, everybody survived. My dog, with Annie, my wonderful dog, was so excited to see me. It was so cute. She would not leave my side yesterday. She slept next to me. She slept, we, I sat on the couch. She came and sat next to me. I don't think she's ever sat next to me that much, so it's pretty and, cute. And that's hard to do when you're a 300-pound dog. I mean, she's, she's 300 what? pounds. <laughs> she's 104 pounds. <laughs> oh my yeah, it's just most. The rest is just fur. It's fuzz. I think she looks bigger because she's in that apartment, which isn't very big, so <laughs> it makes her look bigger. Glenn, you're mean. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, listeners, what are we gonna do with Glenn? No. <laughs> I have a wonderful dog. She's a Newfoundland. She is fun. So, she is great. And she's enormous <laughs> and has a lot of fur because she's from up where Philip lives, where it's cold and oh, yucky. No, way more north than me. Newfoundland is like, I'm south. I'm like California compared to Newfoundland. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, but we have a great show. Uh, I was able to uh, talk to a friend of both Philip and ours, uh, uh, Kim Hirschlow. Uh, she's going to talk to us about her wonderful horse that she's developed over over time. And Caroline Rothman is on the show. She's been on the show before to talk about her lovely mare, Her Highness. And she also won a special award at the Palm Beach Derby this week um, and this past weekend. And, and I thought it would be fun to get an update from Caroline. As always, she's wonderful and hear about the special award she won. So that's what we have. Well, that today. sounds really fun. Yeah. Great people. Nice to have Caroline back on the show. She's a great guest and uh, will update us on everything. And then coming up later in the show, we have our special announcement with a couple of guests. And also, we're starting a special series this week on the Horse Radio Network on leg protection. And we're doing that with Thin Line Perf- uh, Products has come on board to help us with that over the next four weeks. You know how we did the helmet series where we talked about helmets? Well, we're going to be doing the same thing with leg protection and boots and what's right and what should you use when and all that kind of thing. We're going to be doing that in four segments over the next four weeks. So you can look forward to that coming up as well. Well, that's nice. A little education series. I like, yeah. you know, everybody yeah, needs to learn something. And the thin line products, I use them myself, and they're wonderful. I use their saddle pad on every yeah, horse I ride. I like the saddle pad. I think it's a really great product, and I can endorse it fully. So that's uh, it's Me nice too. to have them on board, yeah, because great products, great show. It's going to be fun. 
Well, guys, as far as EHV-1 is concerned, most people have heard that there are a number of cases now, seven or eight in Ocala, that have been all tied back to the HITS grounds here, just north of Ocala. And so that uh, facility is under quarantine, the entire facility. You can come in, but you can't go out. So until the quarantine is over, they're running the show and everything. There's about, what, eight or nine farms in this area, too, that have been quarantined that, uh, that involve those horses. Now, these horses tested positive. Uh, one so far has shown neurological signs and has been carted off, I think, to the University of Florida in Gainesville. Um, now, as far as Wellington is concerned, they, uh, they're still doing the 48-hour certificate. Is that correct? That's what I've heard. And okay. um, when it comes to the dressage horses, the Palm Beach Derby uh, went on. There have been no cases at the global facility. So um, from the dressage standpoint, there at this point is no, um, you know, there are no restrictions. I think people are being cautious and careful about horses that come in and out. Um, I did hear somebody asked me if the Florida border has been closed. Uh, I, no, it has not. it's not, nothing. It's, changed. I got through yesterday. Nothing is in, and so, um, just to kind of, to let everybody know that now it, that doesn't mean it won't change, but at this point, uh, you can ease, I got horses out yesterday. So, um, so it, in that sense, you're, and you're Florida's in a little state. tougher anyway. They do stop everybody coming in unlike a lot of States. Um, so they do stop everybody coming in. You got to have your paperwork. You got to have your Coggins. You got to have your health certificate. What is it? Six months, I think. Okay. Uh, 30 days. 30, 30 days, days now? Okay. So, okay. 30 days, yeah. Yeah. So, you have so it's to have kind of like that. crossing the border. When we cross the border, we yes. have to have everything yes. in line and, yes. and all the paperwork up to date. So, uh, and Florida, yeah, I guess it's a state to state California thing. California yeah. and Florida, I think the only two states I know that do that, aren't they, Reese? Yeah, Kentu- I think so. Kentucky does not, which is no. surprising. But but you can come in and out. But Florida, you do have to have your paperwork. So they are able, if they, they needed to keep the horses in Florida, they could do it yeah. you know, relatively easily. So, um, But at this point, that's sort of the update. And um, I think everybody needs to continue to be diligent about um, uh, what they're doing with horses shipping in and out and be smart horsemen. Um, but I think as, as we all go to competitions and, and the season is going to start gearing up uh, up north, it's just a good reminder that we all need to, to vaccinate and, but also have good, good practices of horsemanship as well. And we got a little. Um, we did do. We're talking a little bit about the pre-St. George Palm Beach Derby, uh, but I do have the results from the freestyle. Lars Peterson from Denmark and Mariette won the uh, Grand Prix freestyle with a seventy-six point four. Shelly Francis from the U.S. and Doctor, uh, 73.62. And Mikula Gunderson and My Lady had a 72.77%. And those were your top three from the Palm Beach Derby. No Canadians in the top three, but they make up the, the bottom, the, well, the next three, the four, five, and six. Diane Creech, Jamie Irwin, and Jackie Brooks um, in the Grand Prix Freestyle. So that's nice to see, you know. Yeah, Denmark, and all over 78%. Uh, Denmark on top and... Uh, yeah, really international uh, competition down there now, huh? There really is, and and all those horses. Um, again, if you ever get a chance to to go to Florida and see the Grand Prix and see the freestyle, you should do it because those are all you know really wonderful top six uh, in this group, all super riders. So uh, worth your time. Everybody was over seventy percent. So I was packing, so I didn't I didn't have the opportunity to run go? over to see it. It was on. It was actually on Sunday. So. Um, I didn't have I didn't have a chance. We were well, pulling out. Well, maybe you can update us on how Cassie did. I mean, we like to we like to hear. Yes, well, I want to Cassie. hear about that anyways. Maybe nobody yes. else does. Yes, uh, <laughs> Philip. Um, since I met her, and you know, yeah, chat when I was down there. <laughs> she, yes, yeah, she's doing a great job, Cassie. She's been on the show, and she's my Brentina Cup rider now. She, um, we decided to to move her on up to the Brentina Cup ranks, um, and she was second actually both days. Uh, the first day sixty four and change, and uh, on Saturday sixty. 63 and change. She did a great job. And Allie Petoskey, who was on the show last week, uh, won both both days. Oh, so wonderful. Yeah. yeah, we had her talk about her horse a little bit and uh and oh that's nice to see, you know. Yeah, it was, it was good. It was great, a good class. Great, great girls. They seem really nice yep. and hard workers and stuff. So Exactly. So Super. but but they had a it, so the Young Adult Grand Prix was actually quite a nicely competitive class and both did well. So um I think uh as we all know and, and and when you have aspirations for Grand Prix, it takes such a long time to um kind of break into those ranks. It you know, you, you get one you know, maybe you, you get your one time changes and then you and you miss your twos or you get your zigzag and you miss your um your pirouette. So it takes so long the the top 
professional riders, it looks so easy. And, and as you go through and, and learn the Grand Prix, it takes a long time. So I never did the young adult Grand Prix that didn't exist when I went through. Yeah, it's or, pretty new, but it's a really nice yeah. program huh? to, to kind it of is. Ease, ease between kind of young rider ranks to, to kind of people who want to be professional or just have a really nice horse that can, uh, can keep going on, right? Keep moving yeah, up without, com- Grand Prix. Exactly. Yeah, without competing against all the top, top horses, right? Right. So. It, really fun, it, yeah. Yeah, this was the Derby, so they got the experience of, of riding at, at, I think the Derby is is it's the 30th anniversary happened over the weekend, and it's just such an amazing horse show, and and just old, and you know, just, just sort of the iconic Florida um, CDI, so um, it was fun to go there and be a part of it, and, and I was really proud of both Allie and Cassie, so they're doing a great job, and Cassie has one more competition, and then she comes home for the season, so... Uh, she's still down there. So getting fun in the sun. Well, I'm very happy to have Kim Hirschlow from Upper Creek Farm on the Dressage Radio Show. She is a wonderful FEI trainer and rider from New Jersey. Kim, I am so excited to have you on our show today. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Reese. I really appreciate you inviting me. Well, you had quite a big weekend with your your wonderful, wonderful big bay horse. Um, he's a gelding. His name is Rose Rose Marin. Is did I say Rose, that right? Yes, Rose Marine. It's actually like a marine, like uh, the boat. <laughs> and Rose Marine, and you call him Reno, yeah. and you won yeah. both the Pre St. George and the Intermediate One Freestyle at the Palm Beach Derby. Yeah, it was extremely exciting because we had just ridden our freestyle for the first time on Wednesday. And, um, you know, it's always a little scary because you got, you got a lot to think about. And um, I didn't know how he would, he would be with the music in the ring. And so it, it worked out really well. He really kind of got into the music and um, it, it goes with him really well. And I just had to make sure I had my timing down with, you know, where, where I need to make my transitions and everything. But it worked out really, really well for our first ride in the ring. So I was thrilled. And, and he's just continuously stepping up to the plate. So it's nice to have a partner that is so willing and so game for just getting out there and doing it. And that gives us both confidence. So it's really, really been a, a great trip so far. And I uh, look forward to our next show in a couple of weeks. Absolutely. So can you give us sort of um, the backstory of Reno? We, Philip and I got the, we had the pleasure to see him last year at the Young Horse um, Conference, but can you tell us a little bit about him? Sure, sure. Um, I was lucky enough to have clients uh, that um, believed in me and, and wanted to give me an opportunity to prove myself as a trainer and a rider and offered me <clears throat> to go find a horse to bring along in Europe. And <clears throat> I've traveled back and forth to Europe a few times working with my trainer um, that I had over there for, for a while. And so I had a lot of contacts. And so we went looking and we found him about halfway through the trip. Um, and it was kind of like one of those things like as soon as you watched him it was maybe like one circle around the ring I thought wow now this is one I really want to sit on you know and um we watched him ride him for about 10 or 15 minutes and then I got on him and and within the first few minutes I just knew it was the right one and he and I really kind of bonded really quickly and our communication was very clear with each other and it was really, really cool. Um, so I wound up going back and trying him again the, the following day, and um, that pretty much um, solidified the fact that I was pretty sure that's the one I wanted. And I continued to look at the horses while I was there just to have a comparison, but he really was um, way above and beyond everything else I saw. And uh, so I was lucky enough that... Um, I made the offer on him and it was accepted and, and he came home with us and, um, he's, he's had his, you know, little things that, that have kind of set him back. Um, right after we got him, actually, we think he cast himself in his stall and he sprained both his front ankles 
as a coming four-year-old. And so he had, like, for the first six months of, of us owning him, uh, he was just kind of hanging out. So luckily, um, I have a horse walker, and he was able to go on that and keep himself moving. But um, so we lost quite a bit of his four-year-old year, just kind of slowly getting him back and, and building him back up because he's a big, long horse. So, it, it you know, we weren't going to rush into anything. And so um, I didn't actually take him out to show until he was just coming five. <clears throat> and um, he was super. Like, he went into the show. His first show he did, he went in, won the class. at like a 70... High seventy score or mid seventy score, and was um, really mentally great in the ring. And I thought, okay, so now now we have more answers, and we know he's he's really uh, got the talent and the, the brain to handle the the show atmosphere. And um, and then he also went through another stage when he was five, where his canner felt really disconnected, and uh, he didn't really understand how to make the the connection over his back and that also took a little bit of time to kind of try to build him up in different ways without putting a lot of pressure on him because he was, he, you could tell he was also kind of worried about it. And um, so I did, I didn't force it on him. And when he was ready and it took, it took almost a year to kind of work it out. But when he was ready, we started to ask for more collection and, and that was really the answer. So, um, it came through and, and, um, it's been up to, it's been a, a great journey from, from that point on. And, uh, last year we came to Florida and we showed third and fourth level and we won all the classes we did down here and, and focused on our training down here and, and then went home and, and did some developing horse qualifiers when he was just kind of learning how to count his tempi. So he was very, very green to do that, but, he was still willing, and and um, I felt like it would be good mileage for him. And so we did that, and he wound up uh, as a for- first alternate with a 70%. And then we went to Devon and showed our first two St. George, second place with uh, 69, 5'8". Uh, so that was a really nice uh, mm-hmm. uh, first for St. George CDI. And um, he's now, you know, stepping into the Florida scene and the CDI ring again, and, and he's showing me that he's uh, he's ready for it now. So um, it's been uh, it's been a long road, but a, a fun one, and, and he's been a pleasure to uh, bring along. And, and you know, I, I just always like to listen to the, the youngsters that I've worked with. To, to, they call me when they're ready for things, and He's um, he's definitely ready now for for this. So, and what's nice is he's just coming eight now. His birthday is in uh, eight days. <laughs> wow, so, that's yeah, that's wonderful. He, yeah, what a what a nice journey, and he's still young. And so maybe you can talk to us a little bit about maybe his highlights and some stuff that you're working on. You know, as far as the training perspective yeah. and, and what, where you're going with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think his highlights are, um, God, where do I start? He, um, in the ring, he just has a presence to him, and he goes in there with, uh, like, he knows it's showtime, and, um, which is awesome, because he's really, really listening to me when he's like that, and it's, um, it's all me, and I just have to make sure I'm sharp enough for him, and I'm giving him a good ride. Um, our training program now, um, for the next week and a half, we're just kind of, kind of see if we can perfect the mistakes that we had, um, this past show that we know things can be even better. So we're going to see if we can, uh, get that a little more solid for the global show that's coming up. And then after that, we're going to, we're going to really kind of train, start training some of the Grand Prix stuff on him because uh, you know, it takes about a year to get that to to be solid and I'm hoping by next Florida season we'll be we'll be able to come out and, and do some um, some Grand Prix. So 
it's a process, and, you know, again, he's going to tell me what he's ready for, so we'll just give him the time he needs. If he needs more than a year, then he needs more than a year. But I think now he's uh, he's so trusting and he's so confident in what I have to say to him, <laughs> which is awesome from a rider's perspective, um, that I think that as long as I explain it correctly to him, he's going to be right there for me. So. Um, it's also helpful having Lars Peterson helping me down here because I really think he is uh, a master. And um, he's he's very straightforward and he's very helpful um, with with his eyes on the ground. It's almost like he rides with you and what you feel. So I think that's really important and to have a trainer like that when you're schooling, you know, a, a young horse to Grand Prix. And um, I'm very lucky to have the opportunity and, and to be down here. And um, and right before I came down here, actually, I bought my partners out on Reno. So Reno is now uh, fully owned by me, which is oh, really, really exciting. Well, that's, that's wonderful. That's yeah, that's always cool. the best way to do it. Eh? Yeah. So, um, you know, future plans would be to uh, probably do the developing horse with him and shoot for the national show in Kentucky and probably Devin again. And after that, come back down to Florida and see how that all works. And if that all looks like it's still in a, you know, moving forward nicely and everybody's in a good place, then we will shoot to go over to train and, and show in Europe for, you know, for that season. So, yeah, time will tell. And, um, mm-hmm. but I, I, you know, I love working with youngsters and, and I think when they have a really correct start, it lays a really, really solid basic foundation for everything else that you're going to ask of them. So, um, I'm lucky and fortunate enough to have had the opportunity with this horse to do that. And um, it's uh, it's my passion. So this is, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm very lucky to go right now. <laughs> well, Kim, you, one of the things that I love about you and, and what we really noticed uh, when we met at the Young Horse is you have a great sense of how you train your horses and you have done that with Reno and he is such a talent. And I think uh, I'm looking forward to see him on the big team someday. And um, but you have a real clear vision for him. And, and I think that that's amazing. And it's even more fun that now you own him. And we here at the Dressage Radio Show want to stay uh Stay in the loop and hear how he's doing and wish you the best of luck. And Kim, how do we find you on the internet? You can go to my website. It's uppercreekfarm.com. And um, there's all kinds of information on my website about myself and my assistant, uh, Catherine Mahon, who is uh, taking care of my farm and my clients back home while I'm down here training and showing. Um, she's a great asset to my team and, um, I'm very grateful to have the team that I have now because it, it takes a team to, to make all this happen. So, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very lucky, but my website has all our information and, um, you can contact us through that or through email. Uh, my email is kherslow at uppercreekform.com and, my cell phone and everything is also listed on the website. So feel free to call. Great. Well, super. Thanks, Kim, for your time. And we look forward to keeping an eye on you guys in the future. Hi, all. Glenn the Geek here. And we're excited to bring you a special offer for Horse Radio Network listeners from one of my favorite companies, and that is Audible.com. Audible.com is the premier provider of digital audiobooks. Audible has over 85,000 titles to choose from in every genre. Thrillers, business, romance, comedy, sci-fi, sports, and so much more. Audible titles play on your iPhone, your Kindle, your Android, or more than 500 different devices that you can listen anytime, anywhere. My wife and I love Audible books. We've been a member of Audible since 2004 and have listened to over 100 books uh, with Audible. 
What horse person, you know, who has time as a horse person to sit down and to read a book anymore? Yet I found the time to listen to books on Audible. When I'm not listening to podcasts while I'm riding, cleaning stalls, or at the gym, or driving, I'm listening to Audible books. And for the listeners of the Horse Radio Network, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 14-day trial to give you a chance to check out their service. All you have to do is go to audibletrial.com slash hrn. That's audibletrial.com slash hrn for Horse Radio Network. And you can download your free audiobook and get your 14-day free trial today. If you can't remember that, just check out our website and you'll find a link to it right there. Enjoy your book. We know you will. Our next inter- interview is a friend of the Dressage Radio Show, Caroline Rothman. She's going to talk about Her Highness. We're going to hear how an update on how this wonderful mare is doing and also hear about the award that she won at the Palm Beach Derby. Well, it is so nice to have our friend Caroline Rothman back on the Dressage Radio Show today. Caroline, thanks for coming on. Thank you guys for having me. <laughs> Well, it was my pleasure to see you. Uh, it was on Saturday, and I saw you at the Palm Beach Derby. We were just uh, my rider had just uh, come out of the ring, and we were waiting for your award ceremony. And you won a very special award uh, this weekend. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, I did. I um, I received the Judy Gooden Memorial Trophy. Um, actually, at the 30th annual Palm Beach Dressage Derby, um, CDI. Um, which was given to the winner of the Intermediate One class. Um, and it's quite special to me because um, my quasi, um, he is not, my, my mom and uh, Al Gooden are not yet married, but engaged to be married, um, is the person who actually gives the award because his late wife, Judy Gooden, passed away from her battle with breast cancer a few years ago. So it was quite special to win that um, award for Al and, of course, in Judy's memory as well. And and how long have they been giving out this award? You know, uh, I think it's about, I think it started the year she passed away, and I, I really think it's five years, five, six, six years ago. Um, but I, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I, I did not know Judy very well um, or Al at that point. So I'm a little bit um, in the dark about that. And you were riding uh, Her Highness O, which we uh, we talked about uh, from the national championships. Maybe you can tell us a little, give us a little update on her and how it's been going and and what you've been up to. Yeah, she um, she's doing really well. She is now doing intermediate one and Prince and George um, Open divisions versus the uh, developing horse classes. Um, so it's a bit more competitive, um, perhaps more um, or less lenient <laughs> with the judges. Um, and she's really stepped up to the plate. She's, um, you know, I've shown now two CDIs. I think she is currently the highest ranked uh, small to horse in the country. Um, and, um, and yeah, she's really, um, you know, moving steadily towards Grand Prix as well at home, you know, um, the Piaf Passage is really developing, um, and, and showing real talent for the future, I think. So I'm quite excited to, to get to have the ride on such a nice horse. And she has a wonderful Piaf. She Piaf, I think for the whole <laughs> ceremony. <laughs> Didn't she, she really so did. And it, I, I was <laughs> hoping nobody saw that, but the entire time they were playing the national anthem, um, you know, obviously I was holding my hand to my side um, to salute the, the, the U.S. flag, and um, she just thought it would be really great to piaf, and she piaf the entire national anthem um, without missing a beat on the spot, happy as a clam, um, really trying to show off or something. I, I'm not sure she what did. she's doing. But. I will vouch for it. I kept she was watching. being good, right? <laughs> yeah. was super in the PF, it, it kept getting better and better and more on the spot. It was, it was actually quite impressive. And um, so I, I she, <laughs> what is kind of your next step for the future? Where are you, where are you going the rest of the year? You know, with her, well, with her specifically, I'm aiming her for the national championships, the same ones I did with, you know, with Pi last year. Um, mostly she, she's still, this is her second season of showing, you know, she's still quite green in the show ring. And, you know, I need to get her out and really, I can still only go so much in there. You know, there's so many more gears that she needs to get comfortable enough to show in the ring. Um, so, you know, I want to take a little bit easy and do the small tour and then next year, or perhaps maybe um, this fall after Gladstone, 
um, try some some I twos or Grand Prix um, because really I think I think that she's really going to shine in that because the Piaf massage is quite special um, and you know I, I need to get the ones on. She's quite hot on the changes, so she needs to saddle a little bit more. But it's such a good horse. I don't want to I don't want to ruin her. I don't want to push her. I want her to enjoy her work and be happy and confident and and keep the sort of you know. Uh, eager to please attitude that she has, which is so so fun to ride. Now, maybe you could tell us, Caroline. Do you have any uh, good up and coming young horses? I mean, the Grand Prix horses are really fun, but the young guys are fun too. Maybe you have some more horses you want to I talk do. to us about. I'm yeah, very you've got big lucky. plans for this season that we might <laughs> we might be able to see you on this this year. Yeah. Um, well, I have a couple. I'm very lucky. I have um, a couple horses coming up. I have a horse, Bon Chance. Um, who I've had, I've, I have had since he's three. Um, he did the four, five, and six-year-old championships. He won the five-year-old reserve and the four- and six-year-old. He's doing the developing horse this year. Um, he has one score. I think it's a 70 or 71, and I'm going to show him again with the intent of doing developing horse on him this year. Um, he's coming along. He has a, a very tricky character, so, um, you know, I, I, I have to sort of battle that sometimes. He's, he's quite, um, quite opinionated, if you will. Um, and then I have also... Um, a client of mine very generously sponsored me on a horse. Um, he's actually the winner of the 2012 KWPN Stallion Licensing Championship in Holland at Sertogen Bosch. He's um, he's now four. Um, he is um, his name is well his previous name was Itwan, um, and we're calling him Amici now. And he will do the four year old classes. Um, he's very special. I can't say that I've ever had a stallion, let, well, a young horse with his, um, you know, such, such a good character, but also really good gait and so trainable. Um, so I'm very excited to get to work with him and I've had him only mm, probably about four months now and he's really coming into his, you know, into himself now. So it's, it's exciting to have him too. Wow. Well, you have quite, quite a stable and you're, you're a wonderful person and you always have a smile on your face and, and you're, you're a good friend of the dressage radio show. So Caroline, I hope you can keep us in mind this year as you go through and we hope to talk to you again for sure. Um, oh, how do we, so. <laughs> how do we find you online? Well, Endel Otts, my partner, um, and I have a business, Lion Share Dressage, and you can find us, um, on Facebook as well as, uh, lionsharedressage.com um, where we have, you know, our, our main business is sales horses and training horses. So we always have quite a few, 30 at the moment. So if anybody's looking for yes. horses, we have plenty. Um, <laughs> so yeah, easy to find we are. So Great. Well, thanks, Caroline, so much. Have a great day. Well, guys, now we have our first of four-part series done with Thin Line Performance Products, all about boots and leg protection and, and what you need when. And uh, we're going to be doing this, as I said, over the next four weeks. So we hope that it's informative and it's helpful, whether you're an amateur rider or a pro. And uh, as Reese said, Thin Line products are terrific products, well-made, last forever. And uh, we, we love them as, as a company. So we, we enlisted their help into, in doing these segments. And Coach Jen of the Horse Tip Daily Show led the way here. So let's take a listen. And right after that, don't go away because we have the special announcement coming up about the dressage radio show. And no, I didn't fire Reese and Philip. They're still here. Hi, everybody. This is Coach Jen, host of the Horse Tip Daily Show here on the Horse Radio Network. Thanks for joining us for this first in a four-part series on leg protection for your horse, produced in cooperation with Thin Line Global. In this series, with the expert help of Elaine Lockhead, we'll cover all aspects of equine leg protection, and today we start with who needs it and why. A good place to start would be why do horses need leg protection? And what types of horses need leg protection? I guess we should start at the beginning, eh? I think so. Well, the reason why, well, why horses need leg protection, you know, with horses, they were evolved in the wild. And so you'll find wild horses to be di- differently built than horses that we see today. So, so through our programs, we have done a lot to change the horse's conformation. But really, even in the wild, horses have no uh, tissue around primarily their splint bone, but as well as around their tendons and ligaments in their lower legs. And if you look at most creatures of flight, 
creatures of flight typically have nothing to protect their lower legs. So it probably has something to do with speed and allowing them to uh, run quickly. But since now what we're doing with our horses is we're breeding them differently and we're using them much differently than they were really meant to be used in the wild. In the wild, they would just sprint a little bit and that would be it. So what has happened is that really all horses need some type of leg protection. A lot of people think that it's really the competitive horse that needs leg protection. But through our research, we've discovered that um, even more frequently you see injuries in the kind of backyard trail riding horses. You see more injuries in those horses than you do in competition horses. Really? One reason is that, yeah, you do. One reason is that the competition horses are booted more frequently because they're, you know, they cost a lot more money, so people are are more likely to work to protect them. Mm -hmm. But horses that are backyard uh, trail riding horses, there's a couple of things that are going on. One, these horses typically are not as fit as competition horses, so the riders are, um, you know, generally weekend riders. So they get out and ride their horse for a couple hours on the weekend. Everybody goes on a hack and has a wonderful time. But the horse's fitness level isn't as high. So when they get warm is when their tendons tend to give. So you get a lot of tendon injuries when the horses get a little bit more tired. Additionally, when the horses get a little more fatigued and you're out on the trail, they're a little more likely to bump themselves than they are at any other time. When they're fresh out of the barn, usually they don't do that. But as with any of us, if we're running and we begin to fatigue, that's when we tend to get injuries. So the every the the everyday kind of riding that people do, it's very simple to offer a leg protection for your horse that will do through depending on the product you select will do many many things for the horse it can either protect them just from bumps it can protect the splint bone which is one of the highest incidents of injuries because it's a very thin bone and it's very easy to break so a lot of people only protect the splint bone but there are also boots available that will actually support the entire tendon structure of the lower leg now Something people often don't think about is turning horses out. Very often we find that horses are injured more out in the paddock than they are in the riding ring. And a couple of things happen. You know, people don't want to boot their horses when they're out in the pasture because they're afraid of heat retention. Oh, yeah. You have to be very careful to choose a product that is not going to sit and bake on the horse's leg. And there are not a lot of products available where you can do that and people also worry a lot about people who are in hotter climates particularly if you're in a hot and humid climate then you also get a lot of skin disease when you boot horses because it just you put the boot on and it gets hot and some materials like neoprene will actually uh, retain bacteria in it and will um, if not create at least accelerate things like uh, fungus on the legs that are called scratches or rain rot or um, called mud fever in Europe. So there are some products on the market that will actually kill the bacteria on the skin and create healthier skin. So you can turn a horse out in leg protection so when they go out and act silly in the pasture, they don't hurt themselves. Yeah, and they're good at that, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they seem to be extremely good at that. And um, so there are some options available. People, you know, are now beginning to turn out more in boots as well as riding in them. So, you know, there are just a lot of different styles of boots on the market that are focused on specific discipline and focused on specific action of the horse and then um, barn or stable care for the horse as well. That's very interesting. I, I hadn't thought of uh, many of those aspects about and heat retention and the 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 materials that the boots are made out of being able to help the skin stay healthy. Those are all very interesting points. Thank you so much, Elaine, for enlightening me. Um, tell folks where they can find Thin Line online because I noticed you have a great technology page that talks a lot about how materials work. Yes, we're very lucky to have run into this material um, 
about a decade ago. You can find it at thinlineglobal.com. Um, our technology is we have a open cell foam that behaves different than anything else in the world. So it's able to be very thin, very effective, very breathable, and moldable. You want the horses to be able to move their legs and feel free and, you know, be forward and happy. And so that moldability, the the ability for this boot to actually act like it was made exactly for your horse is one of the technology points that find on our technology page. Thank you once again for enlightening us on who needs boots and why, and there's lots of to it there. And this, as I said at the beginning of this, this is a four-part series, and this is part one. So stay tuned, folks, for part two, three, and four, because we're going to talk a lot about how the boots function and which kinds do what kind of job. And thank you once again to Elaine Lockhead for sharing your expertise, and thank you to Thin Line Global for helping Horse Radio Network put this series together. You can find them at thinlineglobal.com. Dot com. Well, we have a very special announcement coming up, and we have a couple of guests to help us make that announcement. Uh, their names are Lindsay McCall and Mary Jordan. Let's say hello to them. Well, Reese and Philip, we have a special announcement to make here today, and that mm-hmm. is uh, that involves our guests that we have on the line here. We have Lindsay McCall and Mary Jordan. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Hello. So good to have you on with us today. And Lindsay, let's start with you. We have a special announcement, and that announcement is that we're kicking Reese and Philip off the show once a month, and that you're going to replace them. And they were just giving me a hard time about that, too. Yeah, well, I was just wondering what we did. What you know? What, <laughs> yeah, what did why we are we do in trouble? <laughs> Not in trouble at all. We're giving you guys a week of month to go train your horses so you can go out and and win championships. Because you know, if we have hosts that are actually winning championships, it sounds better for the show. Uh, <laughs> see, Reese? No Good. pressure. I like yeah, no credit. Exactly. I, I never had enough anyways. And it's a very special reason. And the reason is, uh, that was one reason, is to give you guys one week a month off to go, you know, to do your real jobs. And then the other reason is that who is coming on to, uh, to help out here at the Dressage Radio Show one week a month is the United States Para Equestrian Association. The USPEA is going to take over. We're going to talk para one week a month, which I think is very exciting. We've been big supporters of para for a very long time. And Lindsay, you're going to be uh, hosting one week a month, from what I understand. Yeah, whether it's temporary or permanent, at least for now. (laughs) (laughs) Depends how much she likes it, I guess. Um, But uh, tell us a little bit about the para association. Sure. So the United States Para Equestrian Association, it's a a network And it's not only our members, but it's a network of other riders, professionals, amateurs, and it also includes everybody that's involved in para-equestrian, classifiers, judges, um, drivers, (laughs) and it also includes our other disciplines, which are para-dressage, para-driving, and vaulting, jumping, and even raining. (laughs) Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't realize that. So now, Mary, you're one of the you're one of the association members, and and somebody that we've known here at the Horse Radio Network for a long time. You're you're an active rider, and and you're going to be competing in in the comp- one of the competitions we wanted to talk about down in Wellington coming up. God willing, yes, we will. <laughs> <laughs> we always say that. Um, so when it, what what is it, and when is it? It's coming up next week, uh, March 14th through the 17th in Wellington at Global, and I am really looking forward to getting down there. It's It's been a bit of a challenge just with all the logistics, however, uh, and with a virus outbreak, we are really pushing to to get down there and participate, have all the riders have that opportunity. And what 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 is it you're participating in? Is it a... This is the CPEDI three-star competition, and it is actually the first qualifier for the World Equestrian Games in Normandy, France in 2014. So it is very, very important and critical for riders who are interested in moving forward towards the World Equestrian Games 
to attend one of these events, uh, three-star events, with the horse that they plan on trying to make the team with. Can you believe it's been that long? You and I first met when, when, when the qualifiers were going on for 2010. I know. I just was going back through some of those materials, and yes, it it time has flown by. Um, but here we are again, and some of, some of the faces are new, and some have remained the same, and lots of horses have, have shifted around. But yes, it's uh, the excitement is definitely building as we once again try to put together the strongest team to compete internationally that we can. I and mean, Lindsay, I know that that's one of the reasons that we wanted to start uh, right now with you guys, uh, you know, joining the program and being part of it every month is because you are coming into a, another world equestrian games, you, you know, and and a little bit of pride. For, you know, we have listeners all over the world, but a little bit of pride for America here. Uh, Britain's sort of been ruling this roost for a while, and we got to change that. Yes, <laughs> that's the goal. <laughs> now, Mary, what do you ride? I am a grade four para equestrian. So on the classification scale with uh, the grade ones being the more severely physically disabled, uh, the grade fours are on the opposite end of the spectrum. So um, our performances are usually uh, the most technical in terms of the movements that we perform in actual para dressage. And what would that relate to, uh, you know, in able-bodied dressage as far as a level? Grade fours are loosely connected to third level in able-bodied dressage, although we can certainly pull in elements uh, for our freestyles to make them more technically difficult. And certainly at the uh, top FEI levels, those riders do perform, you know, incredible movements. Uh, that you'd see in some of the small tour and Grand Prix horses. We don't passage or pee off, but we can pull in a lot of elements. Now, Reese and Philip, I know you guys work with paras as well. I mean, Reese, yeah, you just I said have a couple yeah. of students, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's really fun. I I don't really approach it any different than with my other riders. Or you know, we all create goals and have to ride tests, and it's it's all dressage and it's all it's all good stuff. Yeah, I'm the same. I have a wonderful student who uh, she, I actually knew her um, before she was in a car accident and I coached her before uh, she was in her accident and then now kind of been part of her rehabilitation process. So um, it's been wonderful to see her, you know, challenge her and and I don't really change anything from the aspect of dressage. Um, sometimes, um, she more has trouble focusing in that type of thing. So we work on that, but when it comes to the actual, what I'm teaching her in the dressage ring, I don't change it at all from, from her to my other students. That's, um, really re- refreshing to hear because I think one of the greatest challenges with para in the United States is that it's still very new. And I tell people I'm a para equestrian and they're like, you're a para what? <laughs> and then. And then I have to explain to them that that para is it is the same dressage. We ride the same 10 meter circles, uh, harmony, submission, lightness, uh, all those goals that we we track down with the horses that we love in the sport. We're we're going after that same level of competition and performance and. Certainly, it was such an eye opener to to be over in London um, and over in, in Europe from time to time to see these FEI para riders perform because their horses that they compete at that level are really no different than a top able bodied dressage horse in the United States. It's just that there's a different classification of rider uh, based on a physical disability. So a huge part of what we face as riders and in our sport is helping to clarify and educate what it is para riders are and what we do. And that's what we're hoping to do by having you guys on the show once once a month is to to help clarify that and so that it becomes understandable. And and uh, uh, most para riders uh, compete able bodied as well. I mean, they they compete in in uh, both classifications. Absolutely. So, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yes. Well, well this will be fun, Mary. What horse are you taking? To Florida, I'm I'm actually bringing two of the kids down with me. Um, 
I have uh, Sebastian, who is owned by D.C. Denison of Vermont, and he's the lovely black Hanoverian gelding that uh, I've competed for the past two years. He was the alternate for the London Paralympics, and he is definitely going to be one of my top mounts moving forward uh, towards Normandy. So I'm bringing him. And then I'm bringing my other homebred mare, uh, Peace Sparrow Sox. We call her Clever. And she is another horse that I, I bred and raised and trained myself. Um, she's a full sister to my World Equestrian Games mount, Paxton Abbey. Um, and so I'm, I'm bringing the two kids down with me. Now, no pressure there, Reese, give, calling a horse clever. No pressure on the horse at all. Because if this horse <laughs> is not very clever, you're stuck. <laughs> she named herself okay, that, good, that's good. all i can say <laughs> she... clever, clever is not necessarily a good thing either that's the problem yeah. <laughs> it clever is all is relative bad. yeah yeah it depends if they're clever at opening gates and letting all the horses out <laughs> you know depends what they're clever at i guess yeah. Mary. i think well ponies, i can uh, ponies are very clever right and i don't <laughs> think that's good yeah it's not a positive <laughs> it's not a positive well she she's very positive and just because she jumped a fence at my house and went down to a re- wedding reception on her own <laughs> and had her picture taken with a wedding party. Um, uh, she wanted some cake, you know? Girl, <laughs> girl has her needs. <laughs> well, Lindsay, you guys are going to be the last week of every month. Is that correct here on the show? Yeah, that's correct. And we're really looking forward to kind of sharing our views and our side of para dressage and um, talking about everything, including classification and funding and just everything that Reese uh, <laughs> covers already and Philip covers already, just on the para dressage side. Very good. Well, that'll start the end of this month. We're looking forward to having you involved. And uh, welcome to the Horse Radio Network, guys. Thank, Thank you, you, Glenn. <laughs> Well, that's exciting news about the show, and uh, everybody will get more information about Para every month. So uh, that should be, and we get a little bit of a break. Hey, Reese, that should be good. Ah, it'll be great. So I'm looking forward and, and to hearing the show and hearing all about what's new in the Para dressage ranks. So um, we can't listen, can't wait to listen for sure. And if with both of you going to compete at WEG next year, you know that's going to take up some time too. And <laughs> <laughs> that oh, would yeah. be great. That would be, that would be that really would be fun. Awesome. Okay. That yeah, would be sh- super. The show should sponsor a couple of horses, I think. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that would be even think, better. I think hint, I, the hint. show could probably sponsor a couple minis. Will that help? <laughs> well, it's a start. <laughs> yeah. You got to start somewhere in sponsorship. Start somewhere, maybe it will be minis. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, you can find our show notes and links to today's guest on our website, dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. You can follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is uh, maplecrestfarmky.com, and my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. You can find me at philipparksequestrian.com, and my email is philip at horseradionetwork.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Thinline Performance Products and Audible.com. And don't forget to check out all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Especially Stable Scoop this week because we do we did the annual fifth annual Horse Husbands episode. You'll find it over at stablescoop.com. It's always the most popular episode we do all year of all the shows on the network is the Horse Husbands, where four of us Horse Husbands get together and bitch about our wives. Uh, so, so that's over at Stable Scoop. What about dot- horse, what a- Will they take a fifth? Will you take a fifth? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's probably I'm sure lot. mine would jump in. <laughs> yeah, well, it's our fifth year doing it, and it really is uh, the most popular episode. And it's not guys that are listening. I think it's the wives that are listening. <laughs> but then it's always followed up by the, it, the it'll be the fifth annual uh, Horse Wives episode next week. There's a Horse Wives And episode. it was meant to be but, originally, yeah. Helena did it because she wanted fair revenge, but uh, she did it originally as a you know an excuse to bitch about their husbands but you know what happens when four horse wives get together to talk they talk about horses and never horses. mention their husbands and we're forgotten again so that's usually what happens in that show oh goodness well, i can't wait to listen <laughs> and i am getting your husband on next year he would i know he would come on there you go. oh goodness well everybody keep your heels down and your shoulders back and we'll talk to you next week